If you have not yet repented of your sins, now is the time. Repent of your sins. If you are yet to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins, today is the day of salvation. If you receive the gift of his Holy Spirit, he has already poured out his spirit on all flesh. And he is saying to you, receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. If you have been born again, then today is your day as well. Now is your time as well. Martha, come running to Jesus. Mary, come to Jesus. It is time. It is time. Let's get to it. John chapter 11. We're going to read uh, several verses. We're going to start in verse 32. Today I want to talk about waiting before the tomb. Waiting before the tomb. Thanks, Bob. I'm not good at titles, so I, I really freak out about it. So appreciate that. All right, waiting before the tomb. <clears throat> John chapter 11, make sure I'm in the right spot, that would help. Verse 32 says, Then when Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she fell down at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Therefore, when Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who came with her weeping, he groaned in the spirit and was troubled. And he said, Where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. If you ever need to come up with a memory verse, brother, that's the shortest one in the Bible. Jesus wept. Verse 36, then the Jews said, see how he loved him. And some of them said, could not this man who opened the eyes of the blind also have kept this man from dying? Then Jesus, again groaning in himself, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone lay against it. Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of him who was dead, said to him, Lord, by this time there's a stench, for he has been dead four days. Jesus said to her, did I not say to you that if you would believe, you would see the glory of God? I'm going to pray. I want to ask for your help. God, I'm asking today that you help all of us. Today we want to believe. Today we want to draw near to you. Today, God, we want to hear what you're saying. So, Lord, if I find myself in a tomb, let me be in a place where I hear you calling my name. God, if I be in a place of weeping, let me be in a place where, God, I can trust that you're going to make it okay. Lord, let me be in a place where I could be waiting on you, listening for the words of hope and salvation. God, let me be in a place today. Let our church be in a place today where we can be close enough to you, Lord to have what it is that you're trying to give us. Jesus, meet us here today. Lord, I want to pray one more time for myself. If there's anything in me that would get in the way of us receiving the word of God, if there's anything in my life that I wasn't able to take care of before I got here, forgive me. Help me, Lord Jesus. I want to be ready to have time with you. Jesus, I feel like you're on your way to this house to do something special just like you did in John 11. So, Lord, do that. Let me be in a place where I can receive that. Help us at the mission to receive what you have brought for us today in the name of Jesus. Amen. You can be seated if you'd like. We're waiting before the tomb. Now, I hope as you read, you began to get the picture of where we are in the Bible. Many of us, we've read some of this. uh, It was preached Oh, well, not this message, but uh, we preached from this recently. Pastor actually talked about some of this not that long ago. And, but this is that well-celebrated story for Christians of Lazarus yes. being raised from the dead. And this part of the text doesn't focus as much about what happens after he comes out of the grave as it focuses on the people and on their trust in Jesus leading up to that fantastic moment where he called Lazarus out. It's about waiting before the tomb. In a lot of ways, I think we can relate to this scene. Life is full of circumstances and situations that we don't have any control over. Mary and Martha loved Lazarus, and they had no say 
he was sick unto death, and all they could think to do was to call out to Jesus, Jesus, go get Jesus, because if he can just get here in time, he can save Lazarus. I've been in situations, I think many of you have been in situations like that. If we can just get Jesus on the way, it's going to be okay. Christian, we got to always remember, if we can just have Jesus on the way, no matter how things shake out, we know he's going to work it out. It's going to be okay. Because we know also that trouble is inevitable. Sickness happens, deaths happen, accidents happen, childbirth happens. Family things happen. Surprises of all color from life to death happen in our lives, and so many of them we don't have much say over. I got to tell you, I thought I had some say in childbirth until I was standing in that room and it was time for the baby to come. I was a spectator at best and terrified the whole time and absolutely blown away when my baby girl was born. But I got to tell you, there was a miracle that had happened. I was there for the miracle of childbirth, but it proved to me I only had the tiniest of parts in seeing her come into this world. Mom gets some credit, obviously, but man, that was an absolute miracle. And every baby that's born before and since and yet to come is a miracle. God's hand is in that. It took a creator, it took a miracle worker to bring a baby. So I'm telling you, we know, I think, circumstances in life happen that are way outside of our realm of control. We may contribute to the outcome, but if we're honest, we need to be people who can call out to Jesus. And I'll tell you, the day my daughter was born, I was calling out to Jesus. Do you remember maybe as a child or as a parent, the scene, let me set the scene for you, the little pudgy hand has a sliver in it. Ouch, ouchy, 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 or whatever creative baby language comes out of their little pudgy mouths. And they either come running to mom or dad or they don't because it hurts. And I can just remember being on both sides of this story where it was like, I want you to make it better. But my mom had this needle that was like this long (laughs) and like this big around. And it came at me like a monster and I was absolutely terrified. Yeah, your chuckles tell me you know the scene. No, no, just knock me out, put me to sleep, take me to the emergency room, don't bring out the needle, I've already got a sliver in my teeny little hand or wherever the the sliver is. But long story short, you and I know you trust mom or you trust dad, you trust that caregiver to get in there with that big terrifying needle and dig that sliver out. There's probably better ways to do it, but it always involves digging and prying and saws and hatchets and evil tools of torture. But you sit there and you endure it. Even, I mean, I remember as a kid, I hid it for a while until it got red and infected and swollen until it got bad enough where I was like, okay, fine. Please take care of this thing. Because I did everything I could do and it's only getting worse. Please rescue me from this situation. No matter how bad it hurts, I know it'll be better when it's over. I think We've got to realize, if we don't already, that sometimes we need that same measure of trust in our Lord. We need to be waiting before the tomb of our life sometimes. Some things are laying dead, or they're broken, or they're in shambles, or they're hurting. They're just plain past our ability to make them any better. We're at the end of our capacity, and sometimes we've just got to say, even if it hurts, I trust you, Lord. Even if the process is scary... I trust you, Lord. Today, that's what we're going to talk about. Sometimes what mom, what dad, what the Lord offers us is not scary at all. It's painless. In fact, we're just, we're running to the throne. We're running to an altar of prayer. We're running to that time with hands held high and a smile on our faces. Yes, I'm running for that blessing, but sometimes the blessing comes with weeping. Trust that Jesus wants to work things out for our good. That's today's lesson. Go home. Just kidding. You're stuck here at least for the next little while. We teach this song to our children, don't we? Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. And I don't know. When I was first in church, I knew that song because we sang it before I ever got into church. But I got into church and I go, why are we teaching kids that? Shouldn't we talk about the salvation and the grace and the the power of God? Shouldn't we 
be instilling that, but one of the first things a child learns is Jesus loves me. And I can see how powerful and how important, important and potent it is in situations like Martha and Mary and Lazarus had. Because how could I trust that mom's not going to just chop my finger off if I don't trust that she loves me and wants what's best for me? How could I trust that the Lord, even in a most painful circumstance of my life, that he's going to work it out? God, you, you saw this coming. Why didn't you stop it before, he got, before it got this bad, Lord? Why, why would you let this kind of thing happen in my life? It gets so much more uh, easy to understand. It gets so much more... Uh, able to fit into my swampy brain sometimes when I can just understand the basic thing that my mom, my dad, somebody taught me as a child, Jesus loves me and he wants what's best for me. And whatever is going on right now, if I but trust him, he's going to turn this into something that's going to be good. How would Mary and Martha have known All they knew was Lazarus was sick and was dying, and before Jesus got there, he finished the job and was dead and buried. Dead and buried for days before Jesus came to the scene. And we read it in our text. Mary, crying, said to Jesus, if you had only been here in time, he'd still be alive. And it says, therefore, Jesus, seeing her tears... Seeing the people with her who were weeping, he groaned, he was moved, and he cried too. Jesus wept. We don't have a high priest who isn't moved with the feelings of our infirmities, but he was in all points tempted just like we are, yet without sin. And therefore, because of that, Because we know he loves us. Because we know that he cries with those who cry. Because we know how much he really cares for us. We can boldly go before the throne of grace. We know confidently that Jesus will give us what we need. Even if it isn't what we ask. There is a time for work. Someone once said, and there is a time for love. This leaves no other time. Jesus, everything he's done that we read in the book and everything he does in our lives, we can put in both of those categories. The Lord is at work in your life. The Lord loves you and he wants to be with you. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. I was young, I'm now old, but I have never seen the righteous forsaken. We could say so many of these great and precious promises. He's at work in your situation, and he loves you. He's at work in what's going on, even if you don't understand. And in those circumstances, he's working out a solution. But he has a plan. He has the plan. He's the way. He's the truth. He's the life. It's his way, not my way. Your will be done, God, not my will be done on earth, just like it is in heaven. Do it your way, God, because your plan is bound to be better than all of my plans. I got a splinter, and I did everything I could, and all it did was get more and more infected. I needed to go to the one who had better resources, the one who had better vision, the one who had the better experience, the one who was more able, who was higher than I. I lift my eyes to the hills where my help comes from. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord. This story is about God's timing. We've heard this, I think, many of us who've been in church for any time have heard it. The story of Lazarus is all about his timing because if you've read this, go back to John 11 and start in the beginning of the chapter and read your way through. He knew Lazarus was sick, was on his way to dying, and he waited two days. If you go back and read that, it said he loved Mary, he loved Martha, he loved Lazarus. And he heard that Lazarus was sick to dying, and he waited two days. 
we could take that and look right at it and understand God's timing is a thing that doesn't fit our timing. Just ask Mary. If you'd only been here, if you'd only gotten here in time, if you'd only come when we asked, Martha said much the same thing. She got to him before Mary did. Mary was too busy crying. Martha, as soon as she heard Jesus was on the way, was out there looking for him so she could tell him the bad news. But Martha had a slightly different perspective. She added to it, if you'd only been here, you'd be okay. But I believe even now you could do something about this situation. It reveals to us in this account that God's timing is not our timing. And I can, I can fall back on this text. I can fall back on lessons like this when it comes down to God. I asked, why didn't it happen? God, that you, you and I both agree. I've read your word on the matter. You're not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God, you want every one of us to come to you in repentance because you want us all to be saved. So God, I've got to believe you and I want the same thing in this situation that I'm praying about. Why hasn't it happened yet? And I can fall back on this and realize perhaps it's that God has a time. Ecclesiastes 3 tells us to everything there is a season, a time for every purpose under heaven, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to pluck what is planted, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to break down and a time to build up, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance. We can understand that there is a prescribed time. We say things like, well, it was his time, it was her time, or it's about time. We, we, we understand that there's certain timing for things, and when they come on time, we understand, well, it was meant to happen in its time. Recently, we talked about the figs that were green. It wasn't yet time for them to bear fruit. They were just advertising that they could. It wasn't yet time for fruit. We understand there is a time for things. But what we learned when we talked about that fig tree was that Jesus determines when it's time. There is a regular scheduled programming, but he can throw up that weird circle that used to pop up on our television screen back in the day, and he can interrupt our scheduled programming, and he can say, no, now it is time. In fact, the Bible says, today is the day of salvation. Now is the time. He decides when it's time. And I want to tell everybody in this place, if you are here hearing the words of this book, feeling the presence of the Spirit of God in your life, Jesus is trying to tell you, now is the time. Now is your time waiting by this tomb for him to call you out into whatever it is. If you have not yet repented of your sins, now is the time. Repent of your sins. If you are yet to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sins. Today is the day of salvation. If you receive the gift of his Holy Spirit, he has already poured out his spirit on all flesh. And he is saying to you, receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. If you have been born again, then today is your day as well. Now is your time as well. Martha, come running to Jesus. Mary, come to Jesus. It is time. It is time. Jesus sets the time. And we are in his house on his day with his book speaking in his name, the name of Jesus. So today is your day and now is the time. If you need it any clearer than that, I'll figure it out. But I'm telling you as plainly as I know how, now is the time and today is the day. I can't wait to hear my pastor preach. And maybe you're going to come and, you know, get me to repenting and feeling convicted. I, that's probably the time. I need to hear it. I am so excited to be in the house of God. We're going to... I, you know, I'm, I'm ready to crank up the band, and, and, but if, if God interrupts that and says, no, it's time for this, I, I'd be excited by that because today is the day. We are here to gather together in his name. It is time to get closer to Jesus. Whew, man. Whatever's happening in your life and whatever is going on in my life, I want to know that Jesus is on the way. If he's not coming when I asked him to, I still want to know he's coming when he decides to. Which means I've got to explore the will of God. 
means I've got to be seeking for him. It means I've got to be talking to him. It means I've got to be in these books. This lesson is out of the, uh, the template, basically, for God's Word for Life, for the daily devotions. And I, and I encourage all of us, if, you, if you've done really awesome this year, if you've done really poorly this year, if you're somewhere in between, just, just recommit again. Maybe today is the day to recommit again. I'm going to get into this because, Jesus, I want you on the way when it's my time to be waiting before the tomb. I want you on the way. So that when I'm at scratching my head and I'm at wit's end, I don't know what to do. I know you're going to work it out for my good. So I'm going to press and I'm going to draw near to you. Use the daily devotion. Dig into the word every day. Get into prayer every day. These are just tools, but they can turn into the ladder that will climb you up out of the hole you're in and get you closer to knowing when it's time for Jesus to do something in your life. He's the God who testifies. Romans 8, 26 through 28 says that the Spirit also helps in our weakness, for we do not know what we should pray for as we ought to, but the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. You must be filled with his Spirit. How could you have this intercessor without it? it Romans continues on and says, now he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is. Because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. I wagged my finger when we read it in Ecclesiastes 3, and I'm wagging my finger again. Purpose. It's not my will, it's his. It's not my plan, it's his. He has a purpose. For everything there is a time, but even when he decides to interrupt that time, he's doing it according to his purpose. I just read out of Romans in chapter 8. That has been one of my favorite memory verses since I've been in the kingdom of God. Why? Because I've had ups and I've had downs, but I know that all things work together for the good of them who love God, who are the called according to his purpose purpose. I need the confidence that I've got things working out no matter what, no matter my understanding, no matter my pain level, no matter my confusion. God's going to work it out. Why? Because I'm going to love him. If I love him, he's working it out according to his purpose. So hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, and you will love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul. With all, why? Because he loves you. And if you get into a love relationship with your God, then you could trust day in and day out, daytime and nighttime, weeping and joy, at times of dancing and at times of mourning. He's going to work it out. Waiting by the tomb, it changes the whole color of it. The clock ticking in your life, it changes the whole nature of it. Your diagnosis, it changes the whole temperature of it because you know that he's working it all out for your good. That's a great place to be. That's where I want you to be. That's where I strive to be. Let's all decide I want to be there. I want to be in the hands of the one who's working it all out. He's got a plan that's way better than mine. He's going to do way better than I can do. It's never too late for Jesus. It's never too late. No matter how hard you go down, this story that we read, this account we read in John 11 proves to us no matter how down it is, no matter how broken you're feeling, God's setting you up for a come up. That's what the uh, more modern folks are saying these days. I took an L, which means L for lost, but I bounced back. God's got your bounce back in His, in his plan and His purpose. You get down, he wants to lift you up. Humble yourself in the sight of God. He will lift you up. Get into his sight, though. You see, he didn't rebuke Mary when Mary said, if you'd only been here. He groaned, but he didn't say, Mary, you're terrible faith. I'm leaving. He looked at Mary, whom he loved, and he felt her pain. And in her pain and in her brokenness, he felt that too. And he said, I think, and there's speculation abounding. I mean, this, the fact that he groaned when he saw this, I've heard 15 different opinions, and I've read 
probably more than that on the internet and in other source books and everywhere else. But here's what I think. I think he groaned. He was feeling with her. Not just for her. He was feeling with her. He felt. Now, I feel you, dog. He really <laughs> felt what was going on in her life. But I also think he groaned some because he's like, if you just knew, if you just knew what I knew, oh, man. I know you're hurting and I'm crying with you because I can't help but feel what you're feeling because I love you. But if you only knew what I'm about to do, we'd be here laughing in each other's arms right now. We'd, we'd already be celebrating and the stones not yet rolled away. I think in part he was groaning just to try to say, oh, saint of God, if you only knew what I have in store for you. I hasn't seen and you haven't even begun to imagine it. The things I have in store for the people that love me because I love them. Oh, just hold on. I'm reading a lot into that one word groaned, but I'm telling you, Jesus believes that, and I believe it, and his word tells it to me. He's got something in store, no matter how far down, and no matter how high up, he's got something in store for the believer. Because he knows it's never too late. And one, t one time he said to his disciples, he ain't dead. I'm using the Vermontese ain't. He ain't dead. He's sleeping. For him, it was just like shaking somebody awake. He didn't even have to reach out a hand and shake a shoulder. He just had to call his name, Lazarus. Come forth. Some fancier preachers than me have speculated that he spoke his name on purpose because if he hadn't called his name, everybody would have come out of the tombs. That's nothing for our God. If he'd have just said, come forth, it would have been like, oh man, I'm going to get carried away. I'm going to stay out of it. It would have been masses pouring out of those tombs. They'd have been like, we're running out of hands to loose them and let them go. They're dropping before we can get to them, Lord. Tell them to go back. Give us a minute. There's too many. I'm... In my, probably, if I'm honest with myself, my middle years at this point in my life, and I read comments that somebody else wrote, and it really resonated with me that I start to think about things in terms of time. Yes. Where's the time gone? Yes. Yes. Time flies when you're having fun. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, it's time to get up. It's time for work. Time to take your meds. Time for me to take mine. Oh, it's time for that annual checkup. It's time. And I start think about, thinking about that ticking time or like an hourglass, how the sand might just be trickling through it. But I've got to remember, and maybe you're there with me. We're a bunch of adults in this room. God knows what time it is. And he knows when it's your time and he knows when it's my time. And the only time I have any say over is right now. What happened yesterday is gone. And what's coming down the road is in God's hands. It's me and him right here and right now. That's what I've got. I'm in that little pinch point in the hourglass. It's right now with me and Jesus. I can do something with that. He can do something with that. And he's speaking to you and he's speaking to me. And he's saying, trust me. If it hurts, if it's scary, if it's easy. There's a time for everything. But I, I, Jesus wants you to know he's in charge of the times. Someone else said, this time, like all times, is a good time if you just know what to do with it. This time is a good time, no matter what, as long as you know who you're hanging on to, as long as you know your wagon's hitched to the one who's going to turn it all around, as long as you know that you're with the one that, like Martha said, hey, you weren't here in time to heal him, but I think you could raise him from the dead. As long as you're clinging to the one who's already got a hold of you, then this is a good time. No matter what's going on in your life today can be a good day. And that's my prayer, and that's this lesson. Can we just, you see, this is a kind of a sermon, and these are the kind of 
principles that we could just can up in like a tuna can and just hand them out when it's time. They could just be these pat sayings we only say at funerals or when somebody is going through a tough time or we're sitting in the ICU with our friends and loved ones. But they're more than just canned sayings. This is real. The song, Jesus Loves Me, that's real. If only you knew. You see, and maybe you can relate to Jesus and feel his frustration and feel his groaning in the moment when you're sitting with somebody who doesn't know him like you do, and they're suffering. Maybe you could feel it in that moment and go, oh, if you only knew like I knew what he could do in this situation right now. Do you want to pray with me? Oh, my thoughts and prayers are with you. I don't know how many you know, backhanded comments I hear at work or I see from people that, I, that, I, that are outside of the church who talk about that phrase. It's more than a phrase. If I'm praying for you, that means I'm getting to work. That means I'm saying, Jesus, would you run to their address in their time of need because I know that you could say it and it'll happen. If I say I'm praying for you, that means something because he's the God who answers prayers. He's the living God. I'm not just throwing out an empty phrase. Today is not a day of empty phrases, and this church can't be a church of empty phrases. You've got to know it. You've got to believe it, and you've got to share it. I know the one who's going to get you through the darkest day and who will celebrate with you in the brightest moments of your life. Just get to know that he loves you. Just get to know how to love him and to cling to him. And you will know like I do that all things work together for the good of them that love him. Who are the called according to his purpose. I've got to show somebody how to trust he's got a plan. How to trust he's got a purpose in mind. So I've got to believe it first. And so do you. So let's be like Mary. And even when we're crying, believe that he can heal. Let's be like Martha and say, but even now I know that whatever you ask, God will give it. Let's be like Lazarus and obey his voice. No matter how dark, no matter how stinky, Lord, he smells. No matter how bad it seems, be like Lazarus and listen for him to call you out. Your come up is on the way.